Okay, here we go. Practice makes perfect. Let's do this. Come on. Smashed it. Once upon a time, there was a consensus in football that the use of video technology to aid referees would finally end all the controversy about refereeing decisions in the sport. If only we had video replays, then we'd be free of the forever revolving discourse around controversial officiating. VAR was introduced to professional football in 2016 and widely adopted by all top leagues by 2019 when the Premier League were the last remaining top five league in Europe to vote in the technology for the 2019-2020 season. Depending on where you are in the world will determine when you first watched a football match that featured VAR, but broadly speaking we now have around six years worth of football, including two World Cups, that feature the use of the video assistant referee. And although there is an awful lot to cover in the nuance of the system, one thing is for certain. There has simply been no alleviation of controversy, outrage or debate when it comes to refereeing decisions. Following the fallout from the Luis Diaz goal that was incorrectly given as offside during Tottenham Hotspur versus Liverpool, not even the threat of the dreaded international break would alleviate all the talk around the use of VAR, as born-again Manchester United saviour Scott McTominay's bluter of a free kick for Scotland was disallowed following a lengthy pause, a word in the referee's earpiece, and a jog over to the monitor on the sidelines. VAR in football, an overall net positive, a misunderstood target of human incompetence, or a broken system that is ruining the game. The Decision Review System, or DRS, has been implemented in top class cricket as far back as 2008. The system works based on a player referral system where if a team, whether batting or bowling, considers the umpire's decision to be incorrect, they can signal for the decision to be reviewed. To prevent every single decision being reviewed and slowing the game down to a somehow even slower pace, teams are given a limit to the number of decisions they can refer for review. Without getting into the specifics, once the decision is sent upstairs, the system uses a series of audio cues, camera angles and ball tracking to reach a conclusion. The decision is immediately sent back down to the umpire on the pitch who either reinstates his decision or changes it based on the DRS feedback. Cricket is a sport that naturally contains pauses in action that perfectly synergizes with a player referral system like this. A ball is bowled, a bat is swung, arms go up or don't go up, and the game pauses until everyone resets and the ball is ready to be bowled again. In this sense, football suffers from being a free-flowing, fast-paced, chaotic mess of a sport which doesn't lend itself to easily identifiable breaks in play, where a refereeing review could be slotted in, presented clearly and concluded before play is naturally resumed. This means that those involved in shaping the laws of the game had a decision to make before the VAR procedure could even begin, and that's when the VAR procedure should be triggered in the first place. A player referral system, like in cricket, was dismissed early on due to several reasons, including the fear that referrals would simply be used to slow games down, force stoppages in play at key moments, and waste time, something we already see happening with the way the substitution system can be abused as players are substituted on with two minutes of play remaining to break up the flow of a game and give the team under the cosh a breather heading into the final key moments. Unlike DRS in cricket, which only springs into action upon being signalled and is limited to being called upon only a handful amount of times, for VAR to work it would need to be tasked with reviewing all decisions all the time for the entirety of a match. According to the PGMOL, a referee in charge of a Premier League game will make, on average, 
245 decisions per game, a staggering number that would make reviewing each one totally infeasible. Instead, a threshold had to be determined as to when VAR could and could not get involved and that means it's time to talk about the bar. As you're probably already aware, at what level this threshold regarding cause for interference sits is described as the bar, more commonly referred to as a high bar or a low bar. This is something that those in charge of the game have wrestled with themselves and is the cause for most of the strife and frustration towards the system once you get down to the root cause of them all. Many people have many problems with VAR and I'd wager that deciding when VAR should or shouldn't be involved is the Rome that all roads eventually lead to. You see, with no option of a referral system, practically all decisions on a football pitch are now potential opportunities VAR could theoretically get involved in. As stated, Given the sheer amount of decisions made by a referee in your average match, it's impossible for VAR to halt play and have a look through all of them. So FIFA had to set some boundaries to manage that threshold. The Premier League website even states that, quote, there is a high bar for the VARs to intervene on subjective decisions to maintain the pace and intensity of matches. This has led to some VAR laws which seem fine at first glance, but can get problematic the deeper you look. Officially, VAR is only used for four match-changing incidents. Goals, penalty decisions, direct red cards, and mistaken identity. For factual factors, such as an offside call, or whether or not an incident has occurred in the penalty area, the VAR will always intervene if it determines the on-field decision to be incorrect. But for all other subjective factors, the law states that VAR can only be used for, quote, clear and obvious errors. A phrase all football fans are sick to death of by now, clear and obvious is an attempt by FIFA to provide some guidance quickly and concisely to when VAR should officially overturn a referee's decision. It makes sense. Football is a relentless sport and FIFA must find a way with words to convey VAR procedure. The issue is, what does clear and obvious even mean? You see, the problem with words is they're just words. Out of the 245 decisions per game a referee makes, how many of them simply can't be argued against? This isn't tennis, a sport fortunate enough that the umpire mostly just has to decide whether or not a ball crossed the line and decide if the ball touched the net following a serve. And even with those responsibilities, top class tennis has line judges and Hawkeye in place to help out. Football is just a different beast. Two players tussle for the ball. One player nudges another. Is it a foul? Well, that depends. How big was the nudge? How much of a nudge is too much of a nudge? Two players compete for a loose ball. Both grab each other's shirts to some degree. Is that a foul? Well, that depends. How much of a shirt has been grabbed? How big of a tug on the shirt was made? When you really think about it, you start to realise just how many of the 245 decisions a referee makes in a game sit in a grey area. Some might seem much more obvious than others, but they can all still be argued one way or another. This was true of the game long before the implementation of VAR. Clear and obvious means something different to each individual person, and confusingly, so do many laws of the actual game, as they are full of similar sounding terminology. The IFAB defines one of the criterias of a handball to be if the player, quote, touches the ball with their hand slash arm when it has made their body unnaturally bigger. Well, what does unnaturally bigger mean? It, it doesn't mean anything. Unnaturally bigger is extremely susceptible for all manner of different interpretations. Every single week in the Premier League, a football bounces off an arm and there's a mass debate about whether or not it's a handball. And it's because the laws are worded like this. But the laws have to be worded like this. There are so many movements on a football pitch, so many caveats, so many opportunities for so many possibilities to occur that the laws can't cover every single permutation and have to act as guidelines for referees to interpret. 
And this is just one bullet point in a series of three bullet points, one of which features two sub bullet points regarding one aspect of one law. We've not even gotten started on the other aspects of every handball decision, such as the location of where on the arm the ball makes contact. The IFAB states that the upper boundary of the arm is in line with the bottom of the armpit, which is kind of clear if all players play football with their arms glued to the side of their body, but it's extremely difficult to interpret when a player swings their arms up into the air to leap up and attempt to control the ball with their chest. It's okay though, because the IFAB include this handy diagram to help us all. Clear now? Uh... Well, it better be as we have to move on. This document is 230 pages long, by the way. And this is where the use of VAR in football starts to move into uncomfortable territory. Not only is there the first highly subjective layer of deciding what an infringement even is, now there needs to be a second layer of decision making regarding if the first highly subjective decision is a clear and obvious error, which is a highly subjective decision in and of itself. It's all gotten a bit complicated here as we dive deep into memory layer 6 of VAR Inception, so let's take a breather and work through an example. In the most recent Newcastle vs Liverpool fixture at St James's Park, Virgil van Dijk was sent off by official John Brooks for a foul on forward Alexander Isak for what was deemed to be a denial of a goal scoring opportunity. The ball is fed through to Isak as van Dijk attempts to step across him and win the ball. In a split second there's a tangle of legs as both men stumble over each other and van Dijk comes away with the ball. John Brooks immediately gives a foul and the red card. First you must ask the question. Is there a foul? At first, it looks like Van Dyke pokes the ball out in between Isaac's legs, but upon rewatch, it seems like he makes contact with Isaac's foot first before winning the ball with the tackle. Is this boot to boot contact before Van Dyke clearly then wins the ball enough to be a foul? The Fouls and Misconduct page of the most recent IFAB Laws of the Game state that a free kick can be awarded for several reasons. The most relevant to this example include kicks or attempts to kick, trips or attempts to trip, and impedes an opponent with contact. Is this Van Dyke tackle a kick? Is it a trip? Does he impede Isaac? Well, that all kind of depends on your definition of the words kick, trip and impede. During a football match, players make contact with each other on the ball, off the ball, with their feet, with their arms, with their hands. And not every contact is interpreted as a kick or as a trip or as an attempt to impede. Does this small collision between two right feet count enough under an interpretation of those words? For hypothetical sake, let's say it does and it's a foul. Well, then comes into question another law. Is it denying an obvious goal-scoring opportunity? Because if so, then the player who made the foul must be shown a straight red card. Well, that depends on your definition of what an obvious goal-scoring opportunity even is. Again, the IFAB gives some guidelines to consider distance between the offence and the goal, general direction of play, likelihood of keeping the ball and location. Here is the distance to the goal. Is this an obvious goal scoring opportunity to you? Isaac's run is heading slightly outward away from the goal. Does this make it less of an obvious goal scoring opportunity? Liverpool number 32, Joel Matip, is tracking close behind, but is he close enough? Maybe you're screaming at the screen right now that the answer to all of these questions is obvious, but it simply isn't. During the halftime coverage on Sky, Townsend was adamant that it was an obvious goal scoring opportunity, but Carragher vehemently argued that it couldn't possibly be, as we hadn't even seen Isaac take a touch, so there's no way we'd know if he'd been able to retain possession with Van Dyke tracking him back. Jurgen Klopp was incensed, Twitter was incensed, Reddit was incensed, and even now, looking back, Comments on YouTube videos and social media seem split pretty 50-50 on this. And we haven't even spoke about the VAR yet. All these layers of decision making have to be made before VAR can even get involved. Now, to complicate things further, VAR checks the incident. Has referee John Brooks made a clear and obvious error here? 
to Andros Townsend and half of the internet, no, he hasn't. To Jamie Carragher and the other half, he has. Does the fact that this is even up for debate mean that it's therefore not clear and obvious? Well, again, that depends on whatever your interpretation of what the fuck clear and obvious even means. To me, it's an obvious denial of a goal scoring opportunity and a red card. If I was on the VAR, I'd check it and give the check complete and not even worry about it. But a quick scroll of Twitter and an eye towards the Sky halftime show maybe says otherwise. Maybe. Who knows anymore? Hopefully you can see what I mean now. Not only are the laws of football vague and extremely subject to interpretation by necessity, but now we have a new layer of subjectivity and interpretation to check the original subjectivity and interpretation. The more you think about it, the more it all starts to ask awkward questions about the whole sport. What even is a foul? There's so much contact in the game, so many boots and shins and knees and arms and hands colliding. They can't all be fouls, can they? So how much is too much? A shove is okay, but how much of a shove is too much? A shoulder to shoulder is legal, but at what specific angle does a shoulder to shoulder become a shove in the back? We all love a hard crunching tackle that wins the ball, but at what point does a crunching tackle have too much crunch? Let's refer to the IFAB laws of the game again. They use the words reckless and excessive force, What's excessive force? To me, excessive force may mean one thing. To John Brooks, it means another. To Stuart Atwell, it means another. And to you, another still. I'm falling through the twilight zone here. I'm ready to tear my hair out. We best stop thinking about it before we all lose our minds. You know, maybe I'll get a lot of comments and responses to this video, which will say that this incident has an obvious answer and I should have picked a different one that VAR did or did not get wrong. But that's exactly my point. To you, yeah, maybe this was obvious, but clearly to others, it's not. The vast majority of incidents in the sport fall into this gray category along the sliding scale that can be argued either way. Now imagine you're sat in the VAR room and you have to sort it all out. It sets up an incredibly strange situation where Brooks and Atwell must have left St. James's Park that night, both being congratulated by many for getting a tough decision right and lamented by thousands upon thousands across the globe, brimming with frustration at their perceived incompetency. I have no doubt Brooks and Atwell got huge amounts of stick and abuse for their decision, no less from a massively influential figure in football such as Jurgen Klopp himself, only for an independent panel of referees to determine that they got the situation correct. Hey, good job guys, you got it right. Maybe. Thousands of people don't agree or care about an independent panel regardless, and they hate you anyway. Don't check Reddit, they're not saying nice things. Controversial refereeing decisions that ignite hatred and anger in the watching public have been around long before the existence of VAR. But wasn't VAR supposed to stop all of this? Focusing back on looking purely at the VAR element of it all, how do you even go about fixing this? Well, one attempt FIFA has made is to raise and lower the bar or the threshold at which VAR gets involved. Each league is free to set their own guidelines on how high or low this bar should be because, as already mentioned, you can't stop the game for a further check on everything and you have to draw the line somewhere. People forget, but when VAR was first introduced into the Premier League back in 2019, the bar was very, very high. VAR rarely got involved and many potential checks were ignored in an attempt to not slow the game down and to leave the authority on the pitch and with the referee. There were a lot of complaints that VAR was ignoring too much and not in use often enough. What's the point in having VAR if they're never going to check anything? The Premier League were quick to act and emphasise to officials to lower the bar regarding which incidents should be overturned, which then led to many complaining the bar was now too low and decisions were being overturned too often. Here's a BBC Sport article from October 2019 that captures the madness beautifully. VAR in the Premier League, 
Baha was too high, now it's too low. The article argues that in the first nine rounds of Premier League games that season, not a single penalty or red card was given by the video assistant referee. During the weekend of the 27th of October 2019, VAR awarded four penalties and a red card. The Premier League took on board the feedback. By the 2020-2021 season, the bar for VAR was raised once more. Here's a tweet from Jamie Carragher in December 2021, where he labels VAR as virtually pointless due to how high the bar is. I wonder if he thinks the bar is too low now, judging by his reaction to the Van Dyke red card that we covered earlier. The Premier League and the PGMOL are in an impossible position. You want the bar for the VAR to be high, to let games flow and to not ruin matches based on a second look at slow motion footage. But it is incredibly frustrating to fans to know that the technology is there and there's a choice not to always use it. This is encapsulated neatly by the IFAB law stating that while the VAR can overturn straight red card decisions, it can't review red cards that result as an accumulation of a second yellow. On the surface, it makes sense as a rule to help quell constant stoppages, to make sure the VAR doesn't constantly get involved and to keep the authority on the pitch. In reality, it's a confusing law that exacerbates fans as a second yellow would change the entire course of a game and VAR is not permitted to look at it. The issue is, an acceptance that a huge number of decisions are simply subjective and could be interpreted in different ways is severely lacking in football fans and totally lost in the rampant tribalism that ties the entire sport together. You can shut your eyes and hear it now. There's simply no way he can give Van Dyke a red card there. He must be incompetent, corrupt or both. This has led to all manner of proposed VAR changes all of which will only act as set dressing to cover the underlying issue surrounding subjectivity. When VAR was first introduced to the Premier League, a VAR check did not consist of the official jogging over to a pitch side monitor to look at the incident himself. Because why would he? The incident is being investigated by three other officials sat away from the noise and distraction of a stadium crowd who are benefiting from being able to replay the incident in several different angles at several different speeds. It's no doubt that in the modern iteration of VAR, a referee rarely ever goes against the advice given by the boys at Stockley Park, as why would he? They have access to so many advantages to ensure they make a correct decision. But of course, there was huge demand for the referee to have to jog over and view the incident on a weird little TV fastened to a plastic stand. Because, hey, there's no way anyone could give Van Dyke a red card there. The VAR must be corrupt or incompetent. Get the ref to check it again. Check it, check it, check it again. I don't understand how you can give that ref. We're seeing other solutions being touted now as everyone grasps at straws on how to solve this. Maybe if we could get the live audio of the VAR discussing their review, then everything would make sense. Then it would all be okay. If only we got referees to explain their decisions, then the system would just work. But again, it changes nothing. We already know what the referees will say. They will explain their interpretation of a highly subjective law. People will disagree with their interpretation and take straight to Twitter and Reddit to claim there's a league-wide corruption against their football club. Stuart Atwell will say it's a denial of a goal-scoring opportunity because Isaac is clearly through on goal. Check complete. Does this satisfy you, Liverpool fans? Does that change anything? No? Didn't think so. To make matters even worse, and yes, it gets worse, there's a huge mistrust of VAR due to some of the absolute howlers the system has made even outside of subjectivity. VAR is ultimately a system administered by humans, which leaves it open to human error, even when regarding objective decisions, such as the indefensible blunder we saw regarding the Luis Diaz offside decision. Even if fans could be willing to accept the VAR's final verdict, the understandable scepticism of the entire process comes into question anyway. 
did they draw the lines correctly? Has the referee been shown this angle of the incident like Sky Sports has just shown us? Have they spent too long checking it? Have they dismissed it too quickly? What doesn't help is a discrepancy that can occur between what the VAR is actually doing and what the fans are presented. If you're in the stadium, you see nothing apart from a generic message on a big screen. If you're watching on television at home, you're getting a mix of the broadcasters showing their own replays, the actual VAR feed, and then the commentary. Just because Sky Sports hasn't shown the lines just yet, doesn't mean they haven't been drawn. As stated previously, football is so free-flowing that the broadcasters need to cut back to the action as soon as it's resumed, and often need to move on as quickly as possible. Once there is a small break in play, Sky will try to make amends by flashing up the offside lines to confirm to everyone that it was checked. However, the level of distrust in VAR and officiating in general is so high that for many fans it's not enough to just show the final screenshot with the offside lines. They need to see the entire process start to finish to ensure everything is above board. There is a league-wide vendetta against their specific football club after all. This leads to a lot of they didn't even check it when in reality VAR checks everything constantly and the full process just wasn't presented to the TV or stadium audience as the ball is already back in play and Haaland is bearing down on goal. With all that said, it seems like VAR has been an abject failure with no redeeming qualities. By this stage in its life cycle, I'd wager that the vast majority of football fans would actually be happy to see the total removal of it and return to the good old days where football had no video assistance. Considering my criticisms and tone throughout, maybe it seems like I'm on board with that notion too. But I think it's important to take this time to remember exactly why VAR was brought into the sport in the first place. In a crucial qualifying playoff for the 2010 World Cup, between the Republic of Ireland and France, the tie hung in the balance deep into extra time of the second leg. In the dying minutes, Florent Malouda takes a free kick and lofts the ball forwards towards French captain Thierry Henry, who makes a run into the penalty area. Henry handles the ball twice with his left hand to control it before squaring the ball to Gallas for the tap-in. Neither the referee nor either assistant has caught the incident. Due to one of the most blatant acts of cheating ever seen on a football pitch, the Irish World Cup dream was over. This is just one example of an obvious incident that would have been corrected by any official if they had seen it. There are many more examples I could have used. Andre Mariner mistaking Kieran Gibbs for Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain and showing the wrong man the red card. Manolo Gabbiadini's wrongfully disallowed goal versus Man United in the League Cup final. I could go on and I'm sure you can think of some yourself. With VAR, when there's not a freak mishap in communication, these incidents and many others simply do not happen. I truly believe that with VAR in place, completely objective decisions are always made correctly. The truth is, shocking decisions used to happen like this all the time in football. Referees are human and humans feel pressure, make mistakes and sometimes miss the obvious. With VAR in place, the Republic of Ireland makes it to the 2010 World Cup. Fact. With VAR in place, Maradona is sent off in the 1986 World Cup quarter-final after deliberately punching the ball past Peter Shilton. Fact. With VAR in place, Chelsea are awarded a penalty against Barcelona in the 2009 Champions League semi-final for a handball on PK. Fact. VAR may be controversial when it's used for referees to re-watch and re-officiate subjective decisions based on interpretations of the laws, but maybe this isn't what it was designed for in the first place. Maybe the whole reason for its introduction was just to catch these blatant incorrect calls from ever happening again. Of course, it's not that simple. Once the technology is in place, it's hard to avoid using it for only the most blatantly wrong refereeing decisions. Even when I use my own logic here, this doesn't particularly hold up. Who's to determine which refereeing decisions are more blatantly wrong than another? It's subjectivity once again. The fact of the matter is, 
if VAR were to go, football would once again be plagued with indefensible refereeing decisions in key moments. They would be infrequent, of course. No matter what everyone thinks, referees are professionals who, on average, get a staggering amount of their 245 decisions per game correct. But VAR 100% puts an end to the true blunder, the blatantly wrong decision, the clear and obvious error. With all of the issues video assistant refereeing brings to the game, the layers of subjectivity, the pauses in the action, the uneasy feeling you feel when you celebrate a goal, is it worth it to avoid the worst of the worst? Because make no mistake, people didn't think officiating in football was good before the introduction of VAR. You can argue that it's not made it any better, but I'm not sure it makes it any worse. Yes, with VAR in place, you can argue that we're still seeing awful decisions that you disagree with, but with VAR gone, you'll still be seeing them. I'd like to point out that if VAR wasn't in place for the Spurs v Liverpool game, Diaz's goal would still be ruled out for offside, as that's what the linesman gave on the pitch. Van Dijk would still be sent off against Newcastle, as that's what the official originally gave on the pitch. VAR is a balancing act. If you'll allow me to get overly conceptual for a moment, let's imagine a scale that ranges from a 50-50 decision that could go either way, all the way through to an indefensible error of judgment. Now, let's pretend we plotted a bunch of controversial incidences across this scale based on our criteria. Right now, I suggest that at the very least, VAR prevents these ones, right at the end of the scale, from ever occurring again. And now, football must ask the question, is this worth all of the negatives that come with the system? Maybe your initial reaction is simply to say, no. What's the point of a video replay system that still allows many incidents to be called wrongly by an individual's interpretation, of course? The worst of the worst decisions were always rare, and it's not worth all the stoppages in play and feeling like you can't celebrate goals to eradicate them. But from my perspective, I think you must remember how gutting it is to watch your team lose an incredibly important football match due to a refereeing error of this magnitude, be it a rare occurrence or otherwise. Watching your team not reach a World Cup because of a blatant act of cheating. Watching your team concede a vital goal because someone has literally punched the football into the net and somehow all the officials have missed it. It's a terrible look for the sport that these incidents have any chance of occurring. All this is, of course, not to say that VAR hasn't helped get more decisions outside of the undebatable correct. FIFA's referee committee head, Pierre Luigi Colina, stated that at World Cup 2018, 99.3% of match changing decisions were called correctly, compared to only 95% if the technology wasn't in place. As I've yammered on about for far too long now, your definition of what a correct decision even is will vary. Kalina says that 99.3% of decisions were correct, but that didn't stop Serbia's manager suggesting that the referee should be sent to a war crimes tribunal when his team didn't get a penalty after two Swiss defenders appeared to hold Aleksandra Mitrovic in the penalty area during Serbia's 2-1 defeat to Switzerland. The thing is, no matter where you stand, I ultimately feel like it's too late to go back. Now the toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't just wedge it back in. Imagine a scenario where the Premier League removes VAR for the 2024-2025 season and then Manchester City are given a penalty to win the Manchester derby when it's abundantly clear the foul took place outside of the box. Not only would the world be furious at the decision, but it would be utterly embarrassing that this sort of thing is allowed to occur, as the Premier League have chosen not to use technology that's been widely used for years. The Premier League would be seen as a laughing stock. It would damage the brand, it would damage the perception of English football. I'm aware I can come across as robotic in these videos, as if I watch all football matches simply supporting the referees and hoping both teams have a good time. Please don't get the wrong impression. Every week I am baffled at many of the decisions the VAR makes that seem blatantly obvious to me. Off the top of my head, this decision 
not to award Aston Villa a penalty against Wolves for a push on Watkins is absurd to me. But for the sake of our own sanity, we have to learn as fans to simply accept that even when it seems like the decision simply cannot be given a different way, there is almost always an argument that can be made. This is a blatant push and a penalty, but you could argue that it's only one hand on the back. The contact made is not enough to impede Watkins, and you wouldn't give that as a foul anywhere else on the pitch. I completely disagree, but oh look, there's hundreds of YouTube comments saying exactly that. The use of the video assistant referee in football has had an incredibly rocky start, to say the least, but the technology and the processes that govern it are still in their infancy. We're seeing technology for semi-automated offsides already in place in competitions such as Serie A and the Champions League, and who knows how much better things can get as technology evolves with time. But no matter how good the cameras get, no matter how many computer chips you put into the football, and no matter who's in charge of watching the video replay, you will always and forever have controversial decisions in the sport. Maybe that makes video assistant refereeing useless. Maybe it doesn't. The answer to the question, is VAR worth it, is as subjective as the situations on the pitch that it's expected to decide. While recently on England duty, Kyle Walker was asked about his opinion on VAR. He said, I like VAR when it helps us, and I don't like VAR when it doesn't help us. Which is annoying, as I've written 6,000 words, and he's just summed it up better than I have in 17.